Welcome to Building the Future. I'm your host, Kevin Horick. You can check out new episodes of the show every Tuesday and Thursday at 2 p.m. If you missed an episode or want to get more information about the show, please visit buildingthefutureshow.com. Welcome back to the show. Today we have Paul Price. He's the diplomatic aide at the Japanese consulate in Calgary. Paul, welcome to the show. Thank you so much, Kevin. Thank you for having me on here. Yeah, I'm excited to have you on the show. You have a, a really impressive background kind of in school and career-wise, and I'm really interested to learn more. But maybe before we kind of get into that, let's get to know you a little bit better and start off with where you grew up. Uh, sure. Uh, so my family immigrated to uh, Canada from the UK when I was quite young, and we moved uh, around a lot of Western Canada, never really living uh, anywhere longer than uh, about a year. So I, I became quite familiar with the region, and uh, I think maybe getting to meet people from a lot of different walks of life left me predisposed towards diplomacy and just trying to understand where people are coming from and finding that common ground uh, between different parties, different stakeholders. And so I suppose that's a uh, why, uh, as a part of a natural evolution, I find myself working for the Japanese in Western Canada. Sure. No, I, I think that's that's fascinating. I always find other kind of cultures just fascinating, right? Whether you agree with it or not, it doesn't really matter. It's just interesting to learn about different things. And, and to be fair, I think, like, I always look back at the kind of, like, food analogy. Like, I, I think some of the best cuisine are from other countries, at least in my opinion, and I enjoy them all the time, right? For sure, yes, and I think that's one of the the job related perks, the uh, opportunity to partake of sushi and sake, <laughs> sure. more so the former than the latter. <laughs> <laughs> that's great, man. So, um, let's kind of walk me through your kind of university education and and what made you you go and take those things in university. Well, it's kind of interesting where my my first. Um, kind of inclination towards what I would pursue as an education was uh, dictated just by the the people around me. Uh, I, I didn't really know what to do with myself. I was living in Brooks, a small town in southern Alberta, population 10,000, and I was doing quite well on social studies and, and legal studies. And so my teacher said, well, you should be a lawyer. And my parents kind of being the typical immigrant parents, it's you got to be a lawyer or a medical doctor. And so sure. I thought, well, you know, maybe I'll do pre-law at the University of Calgary. And for whatever reason, I, I don't know why my principal saw in me some leadership capabilities. I, I was really shy and reserved, actually. Um, so I, I don't really know what motivated him to recommend me for it. But the Global Young Leaders Conference, this conference was being put together um, with some support from the United Nations, but also the U.S. Congress and getting to meet uh, different decision makers, policymakers in Washington, D.C. and uh, New York City over the course of the summer. And so... As soon as I came back to Canada from the U.S., I was like, no, I, I got to change my major. It's political science. I want to do diplomacy. I, I don't want to argue over parking tickets. I want to <laughs> help reach ceasefire agreements on wars and you know trade agreements and so on. Uh, maybe it's not as romantic as uh, I'd initially thought when, when I was switching majors, but I, I don't regret the decision to change from free law to political science. No, totally. I, that's That's kind of fascinating that you kind of not like fell into it, but it just kind of happened organically and you got kind of passionate about, about that. And I, I always love when people kind of almost like fall into a career. Yes, yeah. And I'm deeply appreciative of the, the principal and those teachers that had the, the faith in me to say, yeah, let's nominate this guy to go to this conference. Uh, otherwise, I, I don't quite know where I would be, actually. <laughs> no, that's that's great, man. So you also went to... A university in Estonia, correct? Uh, yes, correct. So, so what did so, you take there? Yeah, that that's a little bit of an unorthodox move. Uh, I'll admit. Um, I uh, was interested, actually, halfway through my my bachelor's degree. My honors thesis topic was on uh, African security politics, but okay. uh, I, I guess I suffer from a little bit of an academic ADHD, where I'm interested in one topic, and then before I can finish a project on it, there's something else that comes up that that really attracts me and <laughs> leaves me feeling really interested. So uh, 2007 was uh, the cyber attacks against Estonia, kind of the first case of uh, large-scale cyber warfare. And 
banks basically being shut down, government websites aren't functioning, just uh, really the whole country's uh, economy shut down in uh, 2007 for a week or so. And I found that fascinating and wanted to know more. So before I'd finished my honors thesis, I knew what I wanted to write my master's thesis on. So I, I was looking at studying with the University of Alberta, but uh, wanted to have you know, some presence on the ground in Estonia, see actually what it's like there, speak with uh, a lot of those who were involved in the decisions during that, that fateful week. So I uh, negotiated a partnership between the University of Alberta and Tallinn University and then went to Tallinn in Estonia for most of my degree program. And um, it was an interesting experience. And I, I got to learn a lot more about uh, that country's uh, cyber infrastructure, uh, the, the basically the birthplace of Skype and the country that uh, first held elections, legally binding elections online. So it was interesting to see what they're doing there and uh, some of the potential applications for that to the Canadian context, uh, especially when it comes to e-health. Sure. No, that that's actually quite fascinating. So do you think they moved a lot of that stuff kind of online because of the attacks or, or walk me through kind of like why they ended up kind of pushing almost like big products and big processes to the internet, right? With Skype and their, you know, a bunch of e-government kind of stuff. Certainly, yeah. I, I think they were already pushing a lot of that infrastructure online before the cyber attacks, okay. but then they realized that the the international attention that those attacks brought, those could be a downside. There could be something that frightens people about doing business in Estonia, or they could use it as a marketing opportunity. And so... They really started to invest more in terms of uh, cyber defense capabilities. And uh, in some ways, they've managed to set the gold standard for ensuring that online elections are, uh, the integrity is protected. Uh, it's tied a lot to a national ID card. I know that that's something that we probably would never see introduced in Canada or the U.S., the, the concern about privacy and so on, a, a card that keeps track of all your transactions and all your movements and so on. But uh, in a small country of just 1.3 million people like Estonia, it was possible to implement this national ID card. So there is an offline component to that security for the online infrastructure. I, I think that's something that's necessary, but maybe not really something we could replicate here in Canada or the U.S. So I, I guess I come away with a sober understanding of the, the opportunities here that maybe we can't necessarily take everything, uh, carbon copy everything that's been done in Estonia and implement it here. Sure. I, I guess I know like people in probably North America would really fear like a government one of those, but in some ways, at least in my opinion, you could tell me your thoughts on this. Like we almost give all that information to Google and Apple depending on which cell phone you use, right? At least in my opinion, they have a lot of that information. Very true, yes, yeah. Uh, they already do have a lot of that information. I think one of the the advantages to the private model, though, is the potential for data siloing, that it's a case of, well, okay, Google knows a certain amount of this picture, and Apple knows a certain amount of this picture, but so long as we don't have one body that has access to all those details, they might not necessarily have a complete picture of your private life. So. I suppose that's one advantage uh, to, to our model as opposed to the public one in Estonia, in which case there is one body that knows a lot of what you're up to. Sure. No, that's a good point. Yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. And some people switch over the years and some people turn off that data and, and whatnot, and you can control it a bit more than if it's just you're constantly feeding this thing to one body. Yeah, no, that makes a lot of sense. I'm curious to know a little bit more of your kind of you know, experience kind of in Estonia you, and kind of your other kind of, um, you know, job related stuff. You, you, you did some lectures, you know, you've got kind of done a bunch of like research and analysis. Kind of walk me through some of that before we kind of get into your current role where you're uh, a diplomatic aide. Sure. Yeah, I'd be happy to. So after I finished my um, degree at the University of Calgary, the undergraduate degree, um, it was uh, 2008, and I think I, I did everything you shouldn't do in entering the work <laughs> workforce. Okay. And so uh, my passion was, okay, I want to work for the OSCE, the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe. Uh, I call it NATO without the guns. It's just okay. talking through the differences with Russia. And a lot of its focus has really been on 
Initially, it was during the Cold War, making sure that there was a, an open line of communication to settle any min- misunderstandings that would form between the West and the Soviet bloc. And after the collapse of the Soviet Union, it was more about addressing some of the ethnic conflicts that emerged in the former Yugoslavia, and the Caucasus, parts of Central Asia. And now, to some extent, there's an interest in getting the OSCE involved in uh, state building efforts in Afghanistan. Okay, and so I, I was really interested in working with that organization, but didn't apply anywhere else, just to the OSCE, and just kind of waited. We were part of the summer, come on, I want my dream job. And somehow I lucked out and I got a uh, um, what should have been a boring research role in Vienna, but uh, it turned out that my position coincided with the war in Georgia in 2008, where Russia was involved in some aggression against uh, Georgian territories, South Ossetia and Abkhazia. And so I, I was involved in a lot of the ceasefire talks and then uh, the talks on delivering humanitarian aid to some of the communities that were affected by the fighting. So I, I kind of had a, a baptism by fire in that sort of role and... Uh, it was enjoyable. Um, wore me out a bit because there were very long days. Sure, uh, of I can course, uh, very stressful working environment. But uh, um, basically, the financial crisis caught up to me in, in 2009. And uh, of course, there's a policy of uh, called zero nominal growth in the budget. So, no growth in the budget even to offset inflation. But of course, the duties and the pressures being placed on the OSC were increasing. So, uh, of course, junior folks like me had to go. So uh, I <clears throat> pursued my master's degree in the hopes of um, enhancing my qualifications and in the process uh, fell in love with Estonia and that spirit of entrepreneurialism there. So I, I stayed after my master's degree and was uh, lecturing, as you mentioned, at uh, Tallinn University Tallinn University of Technology and uh, also the Estonian Diplomatic Academy talking about some of the experiences I had uh, negotiating with the Russians during the war in Georgia. Interesting. That's That's got to be like fascinating just, just having like a day and talking with that and just kind of, I, I don't even know how to like explain that, right? Like that's, or even under, yeah. really understand that. Like this is fascinating to me, right? Like just the types yeah. of stuff you guys are talking about and covering. Yes, yeah, it really was a, a varied work environment because, of course, the war in Georgia was a, a big part of the duties there, but uh, election observation was another thing, too. So uh, sometimes I was having to stay late in the office to uh, do some phone calls, actually, to uh, Jefferson City in uh, Missouri to to see if we could get access for election observers to some of the polling stations and so on. And so, uh, you know, Vienna is eight hours ahead of uh, Jefferson City, or I guess it was at that time due to daylight saving. So uh, it was um, late evenings. <laughs> sure, I can people imagine. Don't pick up the f- <laughs> I found that people didn't pick up the phone before noon in Jefferson City. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> That's funny. So, yeah. so I'm curious, what exactly is a diplomatic aid, and what do you do at the Japanese consulate? So for the the Japanese consulate, my interest is trying to make sure there's a a business environment that's friendly to Japanese business and uh, investment. And of course, ensuring that any strategic commodities flow freely between uh, Japan and Western Canada. So uh, that involves a, a lot of research, sometimes a fair amount of advocacy, and of course, networking with the various levels of government. So uh, we have a fairly large jurisdiction in Calgary. We cover Alberta, Saskatchewan, Manitoba, Nunavut, and the Northwest Territories. Oh, wow. so I think we might actually have the biggest geographic jurisdiction of most Japanese diplomatic offices operating abroad. So it's, it makes things uh, very varied. One day you might be talking about uh, canola exports from Manitoba, and the next thing you know you're talking about uh, gold mining in Nunavut. Really? That's cool. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so, so do you travel right. much? Uh, yes, there's a, a fair bit of travel within Western Canada, and that's one of the things I enjoy. It allows me to become reacquainted with um, my country of citizenship, that uh, spending that time abroad in Austria, Montenegro, and Estonia, I, I really appreciate the chance to travel and, and see more of Canada. And to be honest, uh, none of it's pretty um, hard to reach. It's, I, I think, from Calgary, maybe a $2,200 flight uh, oh, wow. um, return trip, just because it's it's so remote and uh, the connections are so infrequent. So uh, 
I honestly probably couldn't afford to go visit it as a tourist, but uh, you know, doing it through business and being able to to see what it's like there is uh, a dream come true. Sure. No, that's that's great. And do you get to go to Japan um, ever? Uh, basically, once a year, there's okay. uh, some briefings and some discussion of uh, trade strategy and so on. What should we do uh, given the the U.S. change in position on uh, TPP, the Trans-Pacific Partnership? So those make for some long uh, and tense discussions sometimes. Sure, because what what are they like a day ahead of us in? Well, parts of North America, at least? Uh, between Calgary and Tokyo, it's 16 hours. 16 so I hours, guess, okay. uh, say, Washington, D.C. to Tokyo, 14. Yeah, okay. No, yeah, it's still quite a, quite a time difference, right? So Yes, yeah, yeah. So I'm curious, you've kind of traveled a bunch of the world and you kind of work with a lot of people that, you know, aren't from North America. I'm, I'm really curious to know about what are some of the similarities and differences, you know, with maybe culturally or, or business, you know, similarities and differences that you've kind of experienced that a lot of people, I think, maybe in North America never would think of or or is maybe not even on the radar of like, oh, wow, I didn't even realize that. Oh, yeah, for sure. Um, I think um, Canadians might be a bit too humble at times. I, I think we have a, a problem with dreaming big, and okay. that's something that I'm sometimes jealous of when it comes to American entrepreneurs or even Chinese entrepreneurs, that there's no hesitancy to dream big or be willing to say, I am the best at this, or here are the steps I'm going to take to become the best at this. Sure. Uh, and that's the unfortunate thing where Canada, it's kind of a case of, well, yes, we have wheat and you know the food quality is good and it's safe it's nutritious but we're not willing to say you know canada birthplace of the world's best wheat or the best beef or or so on and so forth so i i I feel like we we could use with being a bit more assertive somehow and i don't quite know how we can build that national self-confidence yet it's something that i certainly think about but uh it's a challenge i i think that we're in a way holding ourselves back and there's already these competitive uh, disadvantages that we have from time to time. And uh, on another level, maybe when it comes to that national imagination, uh, Canadians don't seem to see ourselves as part of the Asia Pacific. It's interesting where the geographic distance between Vancouver and Tokyo is actually about the same as the geographic distance between Sydney and Tokyo. And oh, so really? it's strange that we say Australia is an Asia Pacific country, but we don't say Canada is. We we seem to restrict ourselves and say no, we're we're just North American instead of looking across the Atlantic and across the Pacific and and seeing ourselves as part of something bigger. Interesting. Yeah, I could see that. That's the other thing. I'm I'm really curious to know your thoughts on this. Is do you find like I at least find this in a lot of Canadians, but I'm curious to know your take that we're basically people of like uh, the world now. And so many Mm -hmm. people just think about their geographical location where with the internet and even like what you're with your job, like you're basically doing business on a global scale every day. And I think a lot of people don't do that or think about doing that when they could easily do that for for, I don't know what the term or if there is a term for that or there's a better way to explain that, but I thought you're probably the best person to ask because you're basically doing business at a huge scale globally daily. Yes, very very true. And I feel like, though, as well, we don't necessarily have to do it at a, a huge scale to be global. Uh, there's a lot of food products that I'll see, for example, at farmer's markets in small towns in Alberta or Saskatchewan and these have an enormous export potential. There's a chance to sell these in China or in Vietnam if uh, trade barriers are reduced. So I, it's interesting that we seem to think in phases that, okay, if I grow my small business from the local to eventually the provincial, then I can reach the regional and eventually national and, and so on. I have to go step by step. Um, but there, there's that potential actually to skip all those um, steps and actually go from the local to the global. Um, uh, 
we we see this when it comes to maritime lobsters uh, being sold overseas to China and Japan, where they're they're brought the same day uh, on a plane. So it, it's interesting that when it comes to some commodities, we understand that potential to skip stages, but um, for the most part, when it comes to Canadian businesses, yeah, it, it's a very slow growth uh, approach and. Um, as I say, we're, we're psychologically restricting ourselves. Sure. So is there any, and this is probably depend, really dependent on the industry that you're in, but is there like a good resource or websites or things to do to, to say, like maybe I have a small time business in, you know, maybe a smaller town or even a bigger city. And I say, you know what, I think I could really sell my product in this country. Is there a good kind of resource for that? Or is it just kind of like Google and figure it out or... Uh, unfortunately, it's Google and figure it out. Uh, uh, I've kind of for, figured. For, yeah, for Japan, there's the um, Japan External Trade Organization, uh, JETRO, and that really is uh, a one-stop resource for getting into the Japanese market. But um, I've been arguing a lot here in Alberta that we need to have a kind of single window, a website in which an entrepreneur can say, okay, I, I want to build a food processing facility to produce pork dumplings and then I want to sell them to somewhere in the Asia Pacific region and just going to that website and being able to access all the resources that are necessary to find someone who's with the Trade Commissioner Service with Canada, Global Affairs Canada and uh, also find the right people within Alberta's Ministry of Agriculture and Forestry who can let them find the right sites for the facility maybe even find a startup incubator and so on. So it, it's unfortunate that we're lacking those resources. It's it's too scattered. It's almost a, a shotgun strategy to economic diversification we're taking here. Just leave it to the entrepreneurs and eventually something will stick. But uh, sometimes those entrepreneurs need a, a little extra help, a little extra hand up. No, I, I think that's great. And like, I, I know there's kind of, and I don't really want to go like political with this, but I know there's been kind of a big push in kind of North America to be like made in North America by North Americans, but I think like mm -hmm. we don't really talk about exporting our stuff, or at least at least I don't really see it in the media that much about actually exporting what we make here to other countries to bring money, you know, from other countries into North America. And I I don't see anything wrong with either either solution, but I I think to your point like if it's so challenging and we don't really have the resources to help each other kind of move our products out that, you know, it's not doing us any service, right? It's true. Yes. Yeah. And unfortunately there are certain populist movements in both Canada and U S who want to talk about uh, local product identities sure. saying, well, this is made in Alberta or made in Oregon, for example. And to be honest, a lot of the consumers in uh, Japan or in Korea don't really know the difference between Alberta and Saskatchewan or where Alberta is, they know Canada. And so sure. I think that national branding made in Canada or made in America works, but the, these sort of state or local identities, I, I don't really understand the push to promote those on a, a global level. I, I, I think people overestimate uh, the quality of geography education in most countries. Sure. I, actually, I think that's actually a really good point. And I never thought of it like that, to be 100% honest with you. I, I think you're right. Like if you're promoting, like if you're a brewery in Portland and you promote that it was made here in Portland, I think that's great. But you're right. If you're trying to get your beer into Japan, for example, you probably want to say made in America, not Portland, because they're going to be like, where's Portland or what is Portland? Yes, Potentially, exactly, yeah. anyway. Yeah, the same way uh, a Canadian consumer might be confused about a uh, green tea made in Heilongjiang province, China, or Guangdong sure. province. It's kind of a thing of, I don't know, I, I just like green tea. I, I don't care where it was made. I just, does it taste good and is it uh, inexpensive? Sure, that's that's actually really interesting. So I'm, I'm curious to dive a little bit more. Like, is there anything else that we kind of don't really think about as kind of North Americans that you know, other cultures are really kind of, are, are kind of a big deal? Uh, I think sometimes we forget the power of relationships. I, I find um, within a, a lot of cultures, um, and it's not just necessarily the Asia-Pacific region, the face-to-face the -face contact is very important. And so 
I think that's where Canada, for example, is lagging behind Australia is that in-market presence. So you'll have cabinet ministers from Australia or prime minister of Australia going into these markets, into China or into the Philippines and meeting with people, uh, signing agreements and so on. And this is seen as a, a sign or a show of confidence uh, and a willingness to do business. And uh, Canada, for whatever reason, we don't make those trips as often. Uh, it could be the public's concern with uh, the expenses. You know, no one wants to subsidize a politician's um, travel plans or, or tourist uh, stops in different countries. But to be honest, it's it's much more than tourism. It's a matter of actually getting out there and marketing and selling a product. And uh, th- those public figures certainly play a role. And uh, those relationships are very important. Sure. And, and to your point earlier about being an entrepreneur, trying to get your products into those countries, right? Like it, it, it just feeds that, right? And makes it easier if there's a better relationships kind of at like a presidential or politician level. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. If it's just some guy saying, buy my pork dumplings, it's kind of a thing of, well, I don't know if I should trust you. But if it's, well, your political leader accompanied you and said, these pork dumplings are amazing, you should really have them, then people kind of sit up and listen. Yeah, no, that's that's actually really good advice. I, that's, that's actually quite fascinating. So I'm, I'm curious, anything else that you could kind of recommend to people? Um, I, I think also uh, understanding the different pace of uh, business in, in different countries or in different cultures. Uh, I find at least with the Japanese, there's a desire to stick with what you know. So it's a case of, okay, I found a particular project or a particular sector which is proven to be profitable and it's been reliable for my company for X number of years. So we want to stick with that and not really change too much, not really willing to diversify. Um, and on the other side of things, business really happens at the speed of light in China. It's kind of a thing of, okay, I want this. You are selling this. Here's how much I'm willing to offer. Let's sign and let's get it done. Let's let's move forward. I, I don't want to get to know you much more. Let's just move ahead with this project. Uh, of course, the thing is with Japan, that slow but steady growth is fairly dependable. You, it's not going to fall through. You don't need to worry too much about intellectual property rights there because the laws are more or less the same as they are here in Canada or the US. Whereas China, it's a little bit of a leap of faith in some ways. You you don't know exactly if the other party is going to honor this. Intellectual property rights aren't quite well protected uh, and so on. So it's just a matter of whether you're willing to take the gamble of operating in those faster markets like China or if a person wants to go more with that slow, steady, but potentially stagnant growth, uh, like in Japan. I got you. That's in, That's actually quite fascinating. So you kind of mentioned before we were recording that you're doing a bunch of stuff in the agriculture food processing space, and we've kind of covered it here and there. What exactly do you do in, in those spaces? Uh, sure. Well, I was recently uh, elected the Director of Agriculture and Asia-Pacific Relations at oh. the uh, Alberta Council of Technology. Mm-hmm. So Congrats, that, man. That's, that's great. An, an, thank you very much. So it's uh, it's an interesting role, and I'm really enjoying developing the relationships with uh, stakeholders and, and different people operating in the ag uh, space, the, the agriculture and food processing space here in Alberta. And uh, interestingly, I suppose since Alberta is so concerned with diversification, you know, we, we've depended so much on one product to base our economy on. It's just crude oil to the United States, one product to one market. And unfortunately, with oil prices being what they are now, that's not been necessarily good for economic growth in Alberta. So people are looking at uh, diversifying into other industries. Maybe it's agriculture that we can flesh out more, and that could be the basis for future prosperity. And so uh, the government of Alberta was working on a, a strategy, uh, more so with the, the legislative assembly, the, the elected officials. And uh, I had the opportunity to give a, a presentation to them in February about uh, an agriculture or food processing strategy, the idea of basically having a, a regional network of incubators where people can take products to, to be developed. Uh, maybe they have an idea for an innovation. They just don't have a, a factory themselves. And so a kind of fee-for-service program where you're renting a facility, someone builds, or 
builds out this uh, product for you and then you can export it and that initial capital could be invested into your own future uh, facility, your own future factory. Um, unfortunately, there hasn't been too much movement on it here in Alberta. The, the document that was released uh, a couple of days ago was uh, fairly unambitious, so I'm, I'm hoping someone in the near future takes another crack at it here in Alberta um, since uh, um, we're not really going anywhere fast right now uh, economically. The GDP growth is fairly low, so I, I'm hoping that uh, we, we can do something um, much more ambitious when it comes to agriculture and food processing in the near future. Sure. So for people that are kind of maybe in the space, is there anything that they can do to kind of potentially move this along or, or not really? Or is it kind of like call your local government? Like how does that kind of work? I, in a lot of ways, I think it is call your local government, calling uh, your local MLA, a member of legislative assembly and uh, Um, raising concerns about whether or not we're doing enough in the food processing space and um, even raising comparisons to other provinces. Uh, I know, for example, Saskatchewan, just to the east of Alberta, there's uh, POS Biosciences. Uh, It was basically an organization that was government-controlled and uh, invented uh, canola oil, actually. The, The idea of, well, if you crush canola and can produce this cooking oil, that could be a value-added product that could be more profitable than just shipping canola overseas. And so um, it basically continues to be a center of excellence on anything having to do with oils, fish oil supplements, canola oil, as I mentioned previously, just anything having to do with oils. That's what they do. And so perhaps something we could do similarly in Alberta is finding one thing that we do really well and then saying, well, come invest in Alberta. Here's this particular product or uh, genre of products that we specialize in, and this is the facility where you can help develop that. And, uh, basically, you you have people coming from far and wide to invest in that uh, POS Biosciences in Saskatoon. I, I've had Japanese companies who are interested in um, developing fish oil supplements at that facility, and and you wouldn't think, well, you know, come from Japan, a big manufacturing hub in the Asia Pacific region, and do it in Saskatoon, but. Sure. Uh, there you go. <laughs> no, fair enough. But and I don't know. Like, I'm. What is the the dollar comparison? Is their money worth more than the Canadian dollar right now? Uh, the sorry, uh, the Japanese yen. Yeah, is oh, it, uh, the yen worth more than the Canadian? Or what's the conversion? I guess like is uh, the, the conversion's pretty pretty low on the Japanese yen side. I, I think it's. I'd have to check, but it, it's certainly um, about a. Well, maybe eleven, twelve Japanese yen to a Canadian dollar. Okay, I, I guess like my the point is like, if like a, the American mm. dollar to the Canadian dollar, it's basically oh, yes. like twenty five percent, maybe even a bit higher than that, depending on how the dollar is. At least right now, and it's been like that for a few years. It used to be uh, almost like fifty cents on the dollar, right? So yeah, you know, yeah. just for Americans looking to maybe invest in something Canadian, like. Sometimes it's 25% or more of a deal, right? Just your money just goes that much further, right? So I was just kind of curious if, you know, the Japanese yen goes further, you know, coming into Canada than, you know, maybe investing somewhere else or even in their own country. Very true, yes, yeah. And I know that uh, Alberta has actually been sending uh, trade missions down to Silicon Valley recently to see if they can get uh, firms to relocate their headquarters to uh, to Calgary or to Edmonton uh, sure. from uh, locations down there, just in part because of uh, the currency issue. But then on the American side, they raise uh, regulatory issues and taxation and so on, saying, well, it, it might actually be cheaper for you to stay put here in Silicon Valley. So I, I can't really say one way or, or the other on that side, but... Uh, the, the currency might not necessarily play into it with a, a Japanese company relocating operations to Canada, but uh, there, there's certainly um, other advantages being close to the product that you want to develop and also closer to the market, uh, the American market, if that's what you're gearing for. No, that's fair. So I'm kind of curious to get your thoughts on, you've kind of been and worked and done business kind of in a bunch of countries globally. Do you know a bunch of languages or how have you kind of gotten through the language barriers because there's got to be some and you've probably experienced it a bunch of times and how do you kind of get over those translators yeah 
Oh, uh, well, I speak some European languages, uh, okay. of course, English, German, Russian, and so on. But oh, wow. uh, my, my Japanese is very weak. But um, I find actually that it uh, is best to operate in English just because when it comes to briefing or training up Japanese officials who are posted here, um, if they know that I speak Japanese quite well, I understand trying to develop a, a background on some of these really technical issues like uh, oil and gas technologies, uh, extraction methods, and so on, it becomes stressful, and then you want to revert back to your mother tongue, to Japanese. Right. But when you're going to be meeting with stakeholders or ministers on the Canadian side, they're going to be wanting to speak English. So sure. my thing is to stubbornly insist on English and not develop my Japanese too much in order to make sure that the people that uh, I work under have the right terminology and the right background in English to be able to competently discuss these issues uh, sure. with their, their Canadian counterparts. So it's, it's worked so far for me. Uh, you, you'd figure that's counterintuitive to <laughs> not learn more <laughs> Japanese, but uh, it's actually worked best uh, sticking to English. Uh, my one concern is that I'm starting to lose my other languages just due to lack of practice. Sure. No, that's, that's actually interesting. And the other thing I guess that follow-up question to that is, does some of the like the oil field terms or, or some of those things even translate to some of those other languages? Because probably parts of the world don't. That's not a thing like for them, right? Like if they're not a oil drilling company, they might not even have a translation. Is that even a thing, or am I just kind of guessing here? No, it's possible. Like uh, sometimes it's a case of. You know, like the the universal word computer, where you'll have someone speaking another language, and then they are throwing in uh, acronyms for uh, the technical terminology. Uh, for example, steam-assisted gravity drainage, and instead you hear people saying SAGD. Uh, okay. And so it's it's definitely something that happens where uh, uh, other languages just don't have an equivalent, and if you did try to translate it, it, it could be a, a very, very long phrase. So sure. the, the acronyms become very attractive to those speaking other languages. No, that makes a lot of sense. So... Do you find, though, a lot of these people, when you're dealing with politicians, they're, like, as a, I know, like, I think Japanese, and correct me if I'm wrong, um, they, a lot of them take English in school, so their English is pretty good? Um, there is a, a fair amount of English language curriculum, but I think there's a, a strong cultural desire not okay. to make mistakes, and Got so... You. I, I've experienced it somewhat as well in university where you make a mistake, just the slightest grammatical error, and your teacher stopping you to correct you. And so suddenly you don't sound so organic or natural when you're speaking that language uh, because the grammar is perfect and so on. So I, I've had people uh, in, in Germany or Austria saying, well, this is strange. You, you speak grammar school German, but you don't get any of the cultural references uh, oh, or any okay. of the slang. And so I... It, it, the fact that you're not allowed to make any mistakes sometimes is a, an issue. I, I don't think we as native speakers of English really realize how much uh, slang and innuendo is involved in, in what we say. So um, a lot of Japanese speakers are, are, are very intimidated when they come to uh, Canada or to the U.S. and are realizing, my goodness, there's you know, what I've learned is just the tip of the iceberg for this language. Yeah, fair. And like even just the pop culture reference stuff that we talk about, even from like our childhood or that you just kind of work into conversation. And if you're not born here, you didn't really grow up, you know, here. I don't know, just Very like true. watching, yeah. you know, stuff in the 90s or the 2000s. You just Th would have true. no idea what we're talking about. Well, I've even had uh, someone yesterday actually stop me and say, what does the phrase devil is in the details mean? And oh, so I'm, interesting. I'm saying, oh, well, okay, uh, I'll explain because uh, I guess directly translated, it sounds uh, a bit sinister. You know, the devil himself is, is in the details. This is, should I look at this paper for very long or will something jump out at me? Yeah. Sure. So uh, having to uh, explain that it's not to be taken literally is uh, something that I, I have to do from time to time. Interesting. No, that's that's totally fascinating. But Paul, sadly, we're coming to the kind of the end of the show. So maybe oh, let's, no. <laughs> let's close with mentioning where people can get more information about yourself. And, uh, you know, maybe if you want to promote anything that you kind of the Japanese consulate or being a diplomatic aide. 
Uh, sure, yeah. Um, I would say for anyone who's uh, unsure about uh, what to pursue as a, a career, um, someone who might be in university or in high school in the same position that I was in in the past, uh, definitely don't write off diplomacy. Don't think that it's something for just you know, the, the educated elite, just a few people, anyone, just even a, a small town guy from Brooks can wind up working for the Japanese in, in Western Canada. So uh, I, I definitely encourage folks to look into that potential career. And um, if anyone wants to reach out to me, I, I can be uh, reached easily on Twitter at Paul Price, um, P-A-U-L-P-R-Y-C-E. Or you can find me on LinkedIn, and uh, sometimes I write for the Canada West Foundation, uh, which uh, can be found at cwf.ca. Perfect, Paul. Well, I really appreciate you taking the time out of your day to be on the show, and I look forward to keeping in touch with you, and have a good rest of your day. Thank you very much, Kevin. Hope you have a wonderful day. Thank you. Okay, bye. Thank you. Thanks for listening. The music for the show was done by Electric Mantra. You can check them out at electricmantra.com and keep them in the future.